Thank you. Uh, today I get to talk about playing games with IBL. Um, it, uh, really what this talk is supposed to be about is a course, an IBL course that I developed on combinatorial games. And you'll see that's on, that's on the docket. But I really wanted to use this opportunity as an excuse to talk about two other things with you. One of which is just the subject matter of combinatorial games, which isn't the most broadly uh, understood subject among mathematicians, but yet it's not, it's not a bad one, and I think it's a particularly good fit for an IBL method of instruction. And then the, the last one, thing I want to talk about is, is extending this idea of playing games in the classroom as sort of a metaphor for, for other classes that aren't really games-based, or not necessarily even IBL instruction classrooms, but the idea of playing games in the classroom is a, is a valuable mathematical tool. So that's, I got one thing I, I should talk about and the other two are just convenient excuses. So here's the first convenient excuse is I want to talk about combinatorial games as a subject. And hopefully once we learn just a little tiny bit about this subject, you might begin to see why I think this is a particularly good fit for, uh, for an IBL course. So I'm going to start with the game called NIM. A lot of people uh, are familiar with it, probably not everybody, but it's pretty simple to explain, so I'll do that. I've got several piles of beans. Uh, here, I guess beans means spades. Um, and uh, there are two players playing the game. We alternate turns. If it's my turn, what I can do is I can take any number of beans from a single pile. And I have to take at least one bean. I can't just pass. Um, and so I could take all 12 beans from pile one, or I could take six beans from pile one, but I can't take beans from two separate piles. And the, the standard rule is that the first person unable to move loses, which in this game means that the first person, uh, the person who takes the last bean is the winner. So if I've got four piles here, it's not immediately clear whether or not I want to go first in this game. And if so, what is the move that I would like to make to sort of optimize my strategy? So rather than starting with this four pile game, we're going to simplify things a lot. This is lesson number one for your students. Start with a simpler case. So here's one pile. Of, of 12 beans on it, and uh, you want to go first in this game? Uh, the, the answer is yes, yeah, yes, yes, you do. Um, and the strategy is pretty clear. If you have a pile of 12 beans, you will uh, go first and take all 12 beans and win the game. And in fact, you could generalize this to numbers other than 12. All right, I understand. <laughs> I understand that to you and me, this isn't really a generalization, but the students, you know, this is taking something concrete and abstractifying a little bit. Well, now let's start with, now let's have two piles. And this is a little more complicated. I got 12 beans on each pile. Um, uh, Jane, I'm going to make you go first. Uh, how many beans do you want to take off? Of, it doesn't matter which pile, they're symmetric. Don't overthink this. Four, four beans. Jane's going to take four beans from pile two. Uh, my response is I'm going to take four beans from pile one. Then, then what are you going to do? You're going to take four more beans from pile two. I'm going to take four more beans from pile one. And using this sort of mimicking strategy, I've doomed Jane to lose this game. All right. Um, and so the, there's, nothing, again, nothing special about 12 here. But the students have now discovered that whenever I have two piles that have the same number of beans, that the second player to move has a winning strategy. And that's to this, this mimicking strategy. Um, now let's set two piles with an unequal number of beans. Now I'm just going to tell you, in this game, I want to go first. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take I'm going to take uh, eight beans off of pile two so that I'm left with four and four. Then when Jane's turn to go, now she's going first in a game that I know I can win going second. Um, and so just in these two minutes or whatever, three minutes, we've, we've discovered the entire strategy for all NIM games with one or two piles in them. All right, and we've generalized. Um, and we, the students can do this, and the students can come up with these things on their own, obviously not in three minutes, um, but the students can come up with this on their own. Now, I'm not actually going to go back and, and address this one, so if you get bored through the rest of the talk or the rest of the conference, try and figure out what the winning strategy is to, in this one. Um, but I want to go a little slightly different direction and introduce a game that doesn't get much attention because it doesn't deserve much attention. I, I, it's, been, it's been called the game of nimble. All right, so I've got coins on this strip. I'm going, I'm going to go number, uh, number them. I've got coins on this strip here. Uh, they're numbered 0, 1, 2. There's a left end, but not necessarily a right end. It goes on forever. And I can take one of these coins and move it any number of spots to the left on my turn. When all the coins get stacked up on 0, then nobody else can move, and then the game is over. Um, and I think it's not too hard to realize this is just Nim in disguise. All right, this represents a pile of five beans. This represents a pile of two beans. And when I move this coin over here, I've now taken beans off of that pile. So the strategy for NIM, if I know that strategy, is going to work for this game as well. 
And so this game is just Nim in disguise. One of the remarkable things about uh, the theory of combinatorial games is this Sprague-Grundy theorem that I'm about to, to, to put on the next slide here, um, is that all games are Nim in disguise. Okay, well, it's not really all games. It's all games of uh, a certain pretty large class of games are Nim in disguise. So you can take a game and then sort of map it to Nim execute the strategy for NIM, map it back to the game that you're playing, and play the game. And this, this, this uh, map is constructive. The theorem is constructive. It's not just there exists a map somewhere. It tells you how to make that map. All right, and this was, de this was uh, developed by Roland Sprague, Patrick Grundy back in the 1930s. And, okay, so that's enough course uh, background. I taught this in an IBL course. It was a course for honor students at St. John Fisher College. St. John Fisher College is, a, uh, is in Rochester, New York. It's, I'm gonna call, minimally selective um, in the sense that uh, the students aren't necessarily the, the, the world's most foremost mathematical prodigies. The honor students are not necessarily better students, but they're better motivated than the typical student. I didn't have a single math major in this class, all right? And so even within a class that assumed no mathematical background, and had, people had no mathematical training, I was able to get to a proof of a theorem which was proved in the 20th century, which by non-mathematician standard is like yesterday, um, and, and even to understand the proof of this particular theorem. And I thought that was completely amazing, to go from really nothing and get this far in half of a course um, was a powerful testament to that, that this, this idea, this, this content, is actually uh, quite interesting uh, and, and quite well suited for IBL. I'm gonna, uh, here's some other questions I've asked uh, in this course, but let me talk more about the desirable qualities of a course like this. It started with no mathematical background. It's interesting and it's fun because we're playing games all the time, right? All right, um, it's deep because we get to some deep theory behind this and we keep playing games. So you're teaching an IBL course and you walk into the course one day and uh, all right, um, who's got something to present? Mm, nobody, huh? All right, then what do you do? All right, there are various ways of approaching this and it depends on where you're at and what you're trying to accomplish. You can partner up and all right, we'll try and brainstorm something or, or let me give you a little push in some direction, a little mini lecture, a little something or other. Here's what I did is I came to every class with a game in my back pocket, metaphorically. Um, and I said, okay, uh, here's a new game. Here's a game you haven't seen before. Let's play it. Let's." Let's start playing this game. And like what we did with Nim earlier here, we're gonna start with this, you start with the simplest examples you can think of and see how it works. And then you gradually make them more complicated and see if you can develop some idea of the strategy beyond this game. Then we're gonna to come together as a class. You have them work in pairs because it's two person games, so they're gonna be playing it with each other. Um, come to back together as a class. Now we have a bigger data set of everyone was doing different examples. Let's put them all together and try to form a conjecture as to what happens. And then, once we've got a conjecture, now let's try to prove it. And, and, and most of the time when they make a conjecture, it's wrong. And we discover that when we try to prove it or we find someone that's got a counter example. And that aspect of math is also missing from a lot of, of uh, instructional methods. The idea that if you try to prove something and you were wrong, you probably have learned more about the subject matter than if you had proved it correctly the first time you tried it. All right? And this is something I think the students need to experience. And they need to play with math. They need to sort of come up with the strategy. They need to be able to identify themselves what are the simple cases. And this is where I'd like to extend this idea of playing games beyond a course on games. Into, into other courses. So I'm gonna give you some examples. I haven't necessarily used all these myself, but here's what I mean by extending this metaphor of playing games. Um, I found a real analysis book on my bookshelf, and I just extracted this definition of, of uh, Lipschitz function from a real analysis book. And it, uh, the book gave this definition, and not very far after it, with really not, not any more uh, words about it, uh, the student is asked in an exercise to prove that if f is differentiable on an interval and it has bounded derivative, then it's Lipschitz on that interval. All right, this is telling you the rules of the game. This is proving the strategy. We missed like six steps in between, or like three or four or whatever. We didn't play the game. The students didn't play the game. So I don't like this approach that was in the textbook. Now, a savvy lecturer 
might get up there and say, okay, here's what a Lipschitz function is. Let me give you some examples. Even better if I give you some non-examples, but let me give you some examples. All right, a constant function, constant functions Lipschitz, you write it on the board. All right, um, linear functions, linear functions, all right, all right. Um, maybe uh, quadratic functions on a bounded interval, all right, let me put that down. Now let's start making the connection between, uh, between differentiable functions and Lipschitz functions. But that's not right either, because I played the game. We need you to play the game. I think instead of the first inclination, whenever we give a definition, is, uh, is to give the easiest examples and then have the students do the hard stuff. I mean, this is sort of like showing the students a, a video on how to play baseball and then, uh, and then watching, having them watch videotape of little leaguers playing baseball and then all of a sudden, okay, now you get to play for the varsity team. Uh, it, it, there is something wrong here. We're not playing with math. We're not having the students identify what is the simple case. In this case, constant function seems to be the, 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 the simplest case that I can think of for this particular definition. So I think playing games is important. Now, let me give you another example here. Um, I, I, this is from a, what it would be called Calc 2 at my school. I've got a geometric series, and somehow we come up with some formula for summing a uh, geometric series. Uh, and you ask the students, how, what's 4 plus 1, 4 plus 2 plus 1 plus a half plus yada yada? All right, well, all right. First, how, how can we tell whether or not that's a geometric series? And we figure it out, or let's look at the ratio of successive terms, whatever. And then once we'd establish that, yeah, that's a geometric series, how do we reconcile this notation with that notation? This is like a battle that people have in calculus too. All right, and sometimes you just get up, tempted to get up there and declare, right? Using this notation, R is the common ratio and A is the first term of the series and we just plug it in the formula and it works. Well, does that always work? I mean, can we always write a geometric series in a form that looks like that? Well, y yes, yes, we can, actually. Um, but, but the students will ask that. And instead of just saying yes, I'm like, well, let's play the game. Like, everybody come up with 15, you know, 15 different, different uh, geometric series throughout this classroom. See, can you put it in a form like this? And if everybody says yes, now I've got a conjecture. Now let's try to prove it. Let's try to establish it um, using evidence in geometric series. And, this, uh, this idea of can we always do it this way lends, it, lends itself, I think, to playing games. So for, uh, just to give some more examples, I've got a few minutes left here. Uh, I was just paging through textbooks to try and extend this metaphor of playing games to other types of classes. So um, let me uh, start with the first one. I was paging through some linear algebra textbooks. Um, and a lot of them start off by uh, talking about Gaussian elimination on matrices. And they make a definition of what a non-singular matrix is based on Gaussian elimination. Then somewhere later on in the textbook, they introduce the idea of a matrix inverse, and then they tie those two things together. All right, an invertible matrix, a matrix for which an inverse exists, and a square non-singular matrix, those, uh, that's the same idea. But let the students play the game. Are these two things the same? Well, let's everybody generate the dumbest examples you can think of, and then get them, have them be progressively less dumb. Let's make a conjecture. Let's, maybe it's wrong, let's come together as a class and then maybe try to understand why these two things are the same. Um, you know, I've got other examples here of, of uh, in the theory of Markov chains, I've got stationary distributions and limiting distributions. It turns out that all, all limiting distributions are stationary but not vice versa. Uh, have the students play the game. Let's, let's uh, come up with a bunch of these things. Is it always that one is contained in the other? Under what conditions is one of these sets contained in the other set? Or, or are these two sets equal? Um, convergence versus absolute convergence in, in, in the, the theory of series in, say, Calculus 2 or even a real analysis class. You know, all, it does absolutely convergent imply convergent, vice versa. I, and so what I get out of this is, uh, got out of this course was, yes, this idea of combinatorial games was, I thought was a great idea. It turned out to be a great course. But even more so, this has informed every other course that I teach, IBL or not that the students should be the ones generating the examples. I showed them how the definition. They generate the examples. They come up with the strategy, which in this case means some sort of conjecture about the way things work. We put them, we get, come back together as a class to share these ideas and try to extend this one more step. And then we try to prove it. And you know what, more often than not, it's wrong. But that's okay and that's part of mathematics as well. And so I, I was just, you know, this is my opportunity to, uh, to share my insight on, on playing games 
both sort of literally in the games course, but then also figuratively in all courses, in, in a lot of other courses in mathematics. I think I'll stop there. Okay, so the question was, uh, do I have any issues with how, how easy it is to access information uh, about these things online? Um, and um, that could be an issue, and I think that's an issue in every sort of IBL course. Um, yes, that is an issue. Um, I've actually had the fortunate experience that my students tend to be not very resourceful. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, is, which is both good and bad, I think. Um, so um, then some care would need to be taken, of, of course, in developing this. I, I think the key is to ask questions that emphasize understanding rather than process. Now, if I just, you know, if someone just came back to me and says, hey, look, the NIM strategy involves powers of two and stuff like that, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you read that somewhere. And that's okay, but if they, if they understand it and they can explain it. And so I think the key is more in the questions that you ask rather than what, you, what the students find somewhere else. But yeah, my students are incredibly naive when it comes to looking things up. So the question was, how do I assess students in the course? Um, and in this course, what I did was uh, they were writing up answers to questions. I, I, got, I have a few, of, uh, a few examples of questions that I asked. Uh, where is it here? Um, I, I can add, this is just a very small number. I, I had quite a few questions. First, I had students presenting stuff on the board, and they get a little bit of a grade for, for the quality and, and quantity of presentations that they give. Um, and then I have them, I started them off with, okay, you gotta write up neatly the responses to some of these questions after they've been presented in class. And then I go and I pick apart the quality of the writing and the level of mathematical rigor, because these were not math majors and there were very big gaps between what I thought was good writing and what they thought was good writing. And they were good writers from, a, from an English composition sort of standard, but, but it didn't make for good technical writing. Um, and so once we, that gap lowered, then I started, um, now, okay, now you gotta turn in some of these things before we present them in class. Um, I also gave a, a midterm exam and a final exam, uh, which was basically asking questions and then also sort of, okay, here's a new game you haven't seen before. Implement the Sprague-Grundy theorem to map this to NIM and tell me how to play this game. Um, I don't, that's a, a short answer. I could, I could speak for 10 more minutes on that, but I, I don't think I should. So the, the question was, how did I model the games? Uh, did I took a, talk about uh, directed graphs? And I, I did not in this context, at least not with this audience. Um, if, I had, if I would run this as a class for, like an upper level class for math majors, I may have gone that route. Um, but because of the audience I had, I didn't think I needed to make it any more mathematically technical than I needed it to be. Uh, and I also used the word explanation instead of proof a lot of times just because the word proof was scary. Uh, we're gonna establish this strategy rather than this theorem because the word theorem was too scary. It, it, it's a lot of semantic work going on. Okay, so the, the three-part question, how uh, do my students actually discover this Sprague-Grundy theorem? I'm gonna say s sort of, kind of, um, in the sense that my questions really lead them there. Um, I didn't, you know, because I wanted to get this very specific result, um, I, I really sort of narrowed the channel of thinking, rather than going all over the place like IBL courses sometimes tend to do, I really sort of tried to focus in on that. Um, and then the follow-up questions were, how long does it take and uh, how much scaffolding do I have to build in order to get them there? Uh, with my audience, I had a lot of scaffolding to build. I mean, I, I really walked through you know, a proof. Basically, I, I, I took a proof that had been published and every sentence in that proof, I sort of, okay, let's try and make this a lemma. And then some of them needed lemmas to support that sentence. And it was really, really the proof of the theorem in, ended up being, well, you take this lemma, that one, that one, that one, that one, and put them together and you have the theorem. But they didn't necessarily see that. Um, in terms of how long it took, um, I dedicated half a semester, probably plus epsilon, to the study of, of impartial games. And so between the time, the day one, where we started talking about games in general, to when we had established the Sprague-Gundy theorem enough to be able to play other impartial games, uh, that took a little bit more than half of a semester. Um, I, if that, is that a satisfactory answer? Okay. Okay, so the, the question is about, do the students really buy into the fact that 
that, that this can be a game. <laughs> um, uh, um, sometimes I think if I sort of say, now we're going to play a game, then their eyes are going to roll in the back of their head. They're not going to, so I sort of have to fool them into thinking that this is fun. Um, and and it, the more I tell them that this is fun, the less they believe it. Um, <laughs> and, and so, um, yes, I get some buy-in, not, not always, and it depends on the nature of this. This, I mean, I, please, I, I'm sorry, I'll probably offend someone there, but I think it's pretty hard to make the study of Lipschitz functions really in, enthusiastically fun for a lot of students. Um, and so this is sort of like, yeah, all right, everyone's groaning. Um, but uh, I do the best that I can. Thank you.